Like life on the res is a little different for me coming from a pretty well-known family. <coughs> uh, we were introduced to um, drugs and alcohol at a younger age because our parent, my parents and my uncles and aunts, uh, they like to party a little bit. And um, just seeing that as, as a child, uh, you kind of got used to it and saw that as a norm. Um, so I've known about that, ki that kind of activity at a very younger age. And um, I am gay, and having those identity issues at a younger age kind of led me down a dark road because there was really no one else to talk to about that stuff, especially on the reservation. Um, and um, drugs and alcohol started when I was 14. Um, I had my first joint working at a restaurant um, and I was like this is it like this is the, what I want to do but um, well not really it, it just seemed to be the cool thing to do at the time <coughs> and as I stayed around that crowd I noticed that they didn't care who you were as a person as long as you had what they wanted uh, you fit in pretty much and just then from there, kind of just spir spiraled out of control. I was lucky enough <coughs> to graduate from high school, Smoky Mountain. Um, right up the road, huh? Yep, 2001. So long ago. But um, my father actually died that year, too, my biological father. Uh, and the tribe, they were gracious enough to fly me and my sister down there to visit and meet his side of the family for the first time. I've really had a close relationship with my father growing up, and that really devastated me, um, his death, because he was uh, the one I went to. Um, he, I kind of look up, looked up to him. You were a teenager. Yeah, I was Gra 17, I believe. Getting yeah. ready to graduate from mm -hmm. high school, having, you know, kind of like in this kind of probably like experimental, like substance checking out substances mm -hmm. and kind of getting a taste for it and enjoying it. Yeah. And then you were dealt a, a card that was probably pretty traumatic for somebody at that time. Yeah. Um, and I really didn't know how to deal with it. Uh, therapy wasn't really a big thing back then for uh, the reservation or people uh, in Cherokee. <coughs> And so after I came back from that trip, I started using more and more, trying to numb the pain, um, just not having to deal with reality. Yeah. And it never got any better. Um, so I started drinking a whole lot more around 2021. Uh, I did try to go further my education at Western Carolina University, but um, I wasn't really prepared for that type of environment. I figured it'd be like high school. You just saw your friends and maybe skip class every now and then, but um, no, it was, it was just a very different type of setup and I wasn't ready for it. I kind of stopped going to classes halfway through and uh, Were you still living on the res? Uh, no, I was uh, living on campus. Okay. And um, so I never finished there and started working full-time different places. I've never really stayed at a job for too long. Um, but I was always working. Uh, if I had lost one job at one place, I'd start somewhere new. And... Um, started drinking very heavily to the point of blacking out and um, not knowing what I'd done the next day, not really caring either. And I started getting into the bar scene over in Asheville, uh, Scandals, <laughs> O'Henry's, the gay clubs over there. Name dropping, baby. Well, <laughs> 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 um, <coughs> that was the, the gay community at the time. and. I did have a couple of gay friends growing up in Cherokee, 
uh, one very important person to me is uh, Amy Crow. She passed a couple years ago, and um, she's the first person that showed me that it was okay to be gay, mm -hmm. to be who you are and not be ashamed. And um, still good friends with her family, Jeannie Crow. She's watching. Hey, Jeannie. Hello. Um, love her to death. And uh, so we started going over there, hanging out, making new friends, um, just living the life as I saw it. And I got introduced to more hardcore drugs like cocaine and methamphetamine and uh, crack. Crack is horrible. Don't do crack. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that was just what you did at the club. I mean, you drank and then you did a line, allowed you to drink a little more. And I just thought that was what you did. But a person like me, where one is too many and a thousand is never enough, you never know when to quit. So nights would go into days, days into weeks of just nonstop partying. And of course, we had the per cap to um, allow us to do this at certain times. Um, not saying that's the right thing to do, but it's that was my past, and that's how I afforded most of it. <coughs> and I always thought that I was happy, that I was finally around people like me. But it was just a, a false sense of that. And I just started getting more depressed, um, trying to mask it with drug use and drinking. Um, got into a few relationships that never really lasted uh, because of the drinking or drug use. Um, mostly due in large part on my behalf. I'm not the best person to be in a relationship. <laughs> I tend to focus on them more than myself and it, I put everything to the side and it's all about them. And I do have very bad jealousy issues. Um, <laughs> hand over there. Who doesn't? Yep. But uh, I'm I'm working with a therapist right now to fix that. So um, Michelle F, if you're watching, hey. <laughs> um. So I eventually ran out of road to drive through in Asheville, so to speak. I uh, made some enemies here and there. Um, just made some bad decisions overall and ended up coming back to Cherokee. And around that time was when my mom started falling very ill. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I am dealing with allergies, sorry. Uh, around my um, early teenage years, my mom, uh, she was working for the tribe and she got into an argument one day with uh, her boss and her jaws locked up. So she went to the hospital and found out that she had TMJ, turbo mandibular joint disorder, uh, which causes, caused her to grind away most of the bones in her jaw. And the only option at the time was uh, going in and putting uh, metal to reinforce it. And eventually she grinded that away. So they went in, tried to fix it as best they could, and it was just pain management from that point on. So the hospital started medic medicating her with uh, different types of drugs, Z Xanax, morphine, um, other medicines, which I can't remember. But slowly, over time, she just kind of deteriorated, faded away, so, um, became a shell of the person that she used to be. And uh, me and my sister, we did our best to help take care of her, my stepfather as well. And... So I moved back to Cherokee, moved back in with my parents, and helped take care of her. Uh, went to get her medicines, groceries, did the housework. And that kind of enabled me to, since I didn't have to pay any bills, um, the whenever I did work, I just used that money for my drugs and alcohol. And Unfortunately, she passed away three years ago next Monday, um, which was very hard for me to deal with again, losing my other parent. Um, 
And from there, my meth use became totally out of hand. Again, this is my past, and I'm very ashamed of the things I did, but it makes me, it makes me who I am today, and I can't change it. It happened. Um, I would use her medication as money to buy uh, my drugs. And <coughs> one day, uh, probably seven or eight months after she passed, I'd gotten a hold of some bad stuff. I'd been up for about five days, and I was um, seeing things, hearing things that weren't really there. And I'd called 911 five times in one day, <laughs> claiming up and down that people were out to get me, trying to kill me in my own house. Not a pretty picture. And I was involuntarily committed to an institution downstate in Statesville. Um, stayed there for two weeks, and I've not touched that drug ever since. But... Once I got out, I I had made some mistakes with family members and tried to admit to that, uh, tried to make up for it, but in my mind I felt like there was nothing that I could do, and I decided to move away to Alabama for uh, about four or five months. thought I'd found the love of my life down there, and that didn't really work out either. Um, <coughs> I was still using uh, alcohol and marijuana and moved down there with to live with him. Uh, we had gotten an apartment. Everything was picture perfect on the surface, but inside I was still dealing with uh, depression, losing my parents, and I tended to take it out on him. Uh, I would get drunk and... Um, Domestic violence did occur. Uh, I was the abuser. And um, I believe it was uh, in April, I blacked out drunk, and I came to the next morning in handcuffs outside of the apartment. I was charged with third-degree misdemeanor domestic violence. And I was in jail for two weeks, bonded out, and I came back home to the reservation. And then the next year, I was in and out of court with... Uh, going from Cherokee down to Alabama. Uh, finally, got everything taken care of. I pleaded guilty, and I am now on probation for another six months. Um, I have random drug testing that I do, uh, so there's a number that I call every morning. It's color-coded. If my color gets drawn, I have to go pee in a cup. <laughs> and that helps keep me clean, I believe. Um, also... Uh, started taking domestic violence classes, and that has really opened my eyes to um, what it's like on the uh, on the other side. Especially, um, I was recently in a relationship a couple months ago where I was the abused, and um, it's, it's not the best thing to go through. Um, also, growing up, I was witness to a lot of domestic violence on my mother. Um, one of my earliest memories was standing outside a trailer with uh, my siblings at the time. They were step-siblings. Um, just listening to my mother being stabbed and beaten. And I can still, like, feel how cold it was outside and see everything vividly. Um, and that's always stuck with me, which is why I can't believe that I'd become that type of person that would do that to someone. Mm -hmm. But drugs and alcohol uh, can make you do anything. <coughs> so I've been in recovery for the past six and a half months almost. <coughs> and I've accomplished quite a bit. I started a gay support group in Cherokee called We Belong. And... I also reinstated the detox or the NA meetings for the detox patients at the Cherokee Hospital. I'm part of the Res Hope group in Cherokee. Oh. Shout out to Caleb and Caitlin, the lion and the lioness. And I'm also part of the recovery on the Res group in Cherokee, which meets at the cafeteria at the hospital. Sweet. So you hit Sorry, on. Sorry, I, I no, ranted you're there. Good, <laughs> man. You're, you're totally good. <coughs> Bianca's calling for the milkshake, baby. 
<laughs> I, earn, I earned that milkshake today. Um, <clears throat> you hit on something that is like, I think that is worth, in the very beginning, you hit on something that I think is worth kind of investigating and kind of talking about, and that is the, um, that the normalization of alcohol, like as a child, like seeing the f immediate family members consuming and like in my case, oftentimes over consuming. And that's something that like you'll s happen so often. And it, I don't, I don't know that we've ever talked about it on this show before, but I mean, you don't hear a lot about it, but it's like we're at such a critical point in our development that our brains or minds are developing, right? And we're ch our bodies are physically changing. Our brains are rapidly growing and developing. Um, and we're kind of searching for that identity. And somebody, in your case, from the LGBTQ community is e probably even heightened even more, you know, that, that kind of identity and kind of like it's coming from the res uh, specifically too. Um, and to see that, so all these things are going on in our mind, in our body, right? All these changes are happening. <coughs> and then you see this kind of normalization, in, in my case, mostly alcohol, but this normalization of like over consuming. And so what do you want to do? You want to see what that's all about, right? And young teenager, you want to kind of, it's, it must be okay. Everybody, all, everybody that I love mm -hmm. is doing it. <coughs> so then you get a little taste of it, right? You get a little pinch or whatever, you get a little taste, right? And whoa, does that give me some relief? from that chaos that's going on up here with all everything that's changing and this like searching for identity and wanting to fit in and not necessarily feeling like we do fit in and like not knowing like what that's supposed to be. Um, and so like, I don't know, I don't know what else, I don't know, I've had this conversation with my brother. My brother is, so we have, I have three siblings, two siblings, three, three children in our family. Myself and my sister both are in re long-term recovery. My brother never um, experienced addiction, but he drinks pretty regularly, but he drinks very responsibly. Hmm. And I mean, he's a pastor of a church. He's a PhD student at Florida State you know, three kids, 10 year marriage, like, you know, has a life, like has what we, you know, quote unquote, like the, the ideal life, yeah. like the, the picket fence and the whole, oh you know, like all, 2 that, .5 kids. all that stuff going on. <coughs> and so like, we've had this conversation and he's like, you know, he's like, I seeing what you guys went through and like having that kind of like close to home, it, I, <coughs> you know, set, a, set an attention to drink responsibly for myself. <coughs> but most importantly, I'm going, I am teaching my kids right now who are like, you know, like nine, six and seven and like five, I'm teaching them. Like, I'm not just like introducing them to this overconsumption, intru int introducing them to this normalization of being drunk but I'm teaching them that like I can drink responsibly and this is how I do it. And like when, when these conversations have come up, my mother, if she's watching Tammy, I love you mama. <laughs> but like, she felt like, like guilty, right? Because like we recognize this, there's like a level of guilt in the family. Um, because they, they recognize, because we recognized that that was like common commonplace and so like I guess my question to you in that long-winded <laughs> form is like um is like what what was that transition like for you and like how how do we how do we change that culture right especially for the folks that like might not ever listen to this podcast because they don't have any reason to right because they're not in recovery or they don't have an immediate family member like what are because it's either like it's either like you drink or you don't it's kind of like the if you take a step back and look at like society as a as a whole like you're either 
you're either abstinent and you don't drink or like it's just assumed that you drink to intoxication Mm -hmm. and there's not a lot of like talks about like doing it responsibly yeah you know you know what i'm saying well, um, I don't even know if that, that's really a question, but just like maybe like what are your there's a question on? in yeah, there yeah. somewhere. <laughs> I'll, I'll try <laughs> to get into that because um. <coughs> that sounds like like what I described in like as a part of like if you experienced yourself mm-hmm. um, and being um, involved in the LGBTQ community and like it not probably back then what in the late nineties, yeah, in the late nineties, like you know it probably. It was pretty much non-existent. I mean, yeah. Um, well, first of all, I think it is up to the person to make that personal choice of whether they want to drink or do drugs, and then again, if they want to do it responsibly. But on the reservation, um, growing up there, I, I noticed that, and now, that there's just not that much to do for the younger generation. So boredom sets in and then you hear about a party somewhere and there's probably drinking smoking going on and some families they don't mind if their kids uh experiment as long as they are there to kind of chaperone and that's not just on the reservation i mean that's worldwide and so they that um mentality is uh, pretty much set on them at that age and they think it's e- it's okay to do as long as mom and dad say it's okay but um, and that was wasn't really my case I kind of tried to hide my use from my parents because I knew that belt hurt or that switch you had to go outside and pick your own switch and I always came back with this little raggedy stick and I'd say, nope, go get that branch. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But uh, I do believe it is up to that individual to make that choice for themselves. And we as a Cherokee people, and I know I'll probably get some flack for this, but this is just my opinion. This is what I believe. We as a Cherokee people are very uh, spoiled. Uh, We do get the per capita checks twice a year. We have free health care. (coughs) <coughs> free education as long as it's in state and very few individuals uh, take these um, opportunities and use them and the rest we take for granted what we have and we say oh that hospital is just horrible and we don't have the doctors or the staff to fill it but um, we do and if they just take advantage of the opportunities that we have or the services that are provided, we'd see the better side of it. And it took me the longest time to realize that um, whenever my mom passed, I started getting on with Anna Lanishki, the (coughs) Behavioral Health Center in Cherokee, and they have helped me in so many ways. And I implore anyone with substance abuse problems or mental health issues to contact the hospital or on Alanishki because they have an amazing staff there that can help in so many ways. I want to ask you both of you guys this. I don't know <coughs> if I've ever asked anybody this before, but in like talking to different folks, uh, both on the podcast and personally, um, it seems to be a level of trust that's lacking. Yeah. And <coughs> but there definitely see, seems to be some momentum shifting. Mm-hmm into kind of earning that trust back or building some trust? Well, I mean, growing up in a small town, everyone knows your business before you do. And um, at a time, there was um, certain issues with people's uh, information or... um, private stuff that was going on with the hospital. Um, People were talking about, like, say a person came into the hospital and um, it was for something bad. They go and gossip and um, the word gets around town and before you know it, your business is pretty much public information. But 
<coughs> excuse me, here recently, I have brought that issue up to uh, Anna Lenineshki and the hospital, and um, they have started working over the years to uh, make that not an issue, not a problem anymore. But um, I'm the kind of person where I'll tell my business, I don't care. There's no shame in my game. Um, probably heard about it before, and it <laughs> probably won't be the last time you'll hear about it. As long as you're talking about me, my, my name's in your mouth, so I hope it tastes good. <laughs> but yeah, it's gotten better. <laughs> awesome. Sorry, I'm, uh, I was just... That's probably harsh. But letting some folks know <laughs> that um, the Wi-Fi connection seems to be acting up a little bit. Uh -oh. And so I'll just letting everybody know that we will be posting the show um, on our YouTube channel as soon as we finish up tonight. It will be, uh, it'll be posted up there. So just bear with us. We're looking for a permanent home <coughs> that has high-speed killer Wi-Fi. If you notice the last two podcasts that I did in Asheville, no issue. Did you see that? Mm -hmm. Both of them at uh, Macon Hole and just at uh, private residence. No issues whatsoever. So, <coughs> what is We Belong? Oh and where did this, <coughs> where did this, uh, this idea, this concept, how did it like come to life? And then like, what, what do you guys do? What is it? How do you get involved? All, all the good stuff. We Belong started over. Uh, just a cigarette break, actually. <laughs> There's a peer support specialist at Anna Lanishki. Her name's Jill Wright Smith. Hey, Jill. Hope you're watching. Hi. She's on there. Oh, cool. And um, after my mom passed, she she helped me quite a bit get through that, as well as my therapist at the time. And we were just sitting there talking one day and um, talking about uh, life, the pursuit of happiness, being gay in Cherokee, what it meant for us to be gay and out. <coughs> and we kind of just wanted a safe place for gay people, bi people, the whole LGBTQ community, lesbians, everyone, transgendered, somewhere where they could be safe and um, be okay to be who they were. And that's what We Belong is. Uh, we provide a safe and sober environment at the Analanishki Recovery Center and Behavioral Health for those type individuals. And Carter's running loose, sorry. <laughs> um, but um, it's just a safe place to be who you are. No fear um, and no one to, um, oh, what's the word? No judgment. No judgment, yeah. yeah. And so <coughs> it's been up and down with the number of individuals that come, but um, I'm always there every Wednesday at 5 p.m., rain, sleet, or snow, unless I have a hair appointment. <laughs> Very important stuff. Yeah. <coughs> um, you, is there like a specific format that you follow? Is it more just like a... Uh, no format. We okay. um, Well, some nights we watch a movie, a gay-themed movie. Mm -hmm. uh, some nights we do stick meetings where it's similar to an NA stick meeting. There's a topic on each side of the stick and you speak on that subject or you just check in. Um, and most of the time we just sit at the uh, conference table and talk about life. Anybody's welcome to attend? Everyone is welcome. You don't have to be gay. Uh, we ask allies and supporters to join us as well, family members, anyone um, that is struggling with coming out issues or identity issues. So j overall just a safe place to come and yeah. kind of get some support. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we don't sit around a table and sing Kumbaya and talk about our feelings. We do talk about our feelings, but um, there's, it's, <coughs> it's not really that, that type of group. It, it's just come as you are and be who you are. So why did you decide that this type of program was needed in your community? It's needed now more than ever because, um, um, being gay in Cherokee is not really talked about. It's a very closeted issue. And I mean, there I know several people that are gay and kind of out to the community, but um, you just don't <coughs> talk about it. We are kind of religious on the reservation. I mean, several churches, different denominations. 
<coughs> excuse me, but um, it's just not really discussed, and that's surprising coming from the Cherokee people because in the traditional days before settlers arrived, before we were colonized, uh, we there were people, Native American people, that were known as two-spirited, and they had both the male and the female spirit, and they were highly revered in the tribes. They were actually up there with the chiefs and the uh, wise men and the shaman, <coughs> and it was um, uh, highly praised if, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, if you were two-spirited or if you had someone in your family that was two-spirited. And then religion came. We always believed in the one creator, the supreme being who placed us here. And then once, uh, no offense, the white man arrived and <laughs> uh, brought religion and the Bible, uh, we started to um, acclimate to that way of thinking and that mentality. And then over the years, uh, as time went on, we were, the Trail of Tears happened, and we kind of uh, lost a lot of our culture and our heritage. And we were made to think and um, learn the ways of the white man. And um, so I believe it was at that point that we lost th that way of thinking of the two-spirited people. Um, as being highly revered, and now it's just, it's not even talked about. Um, I know of a man right now that uh, he did his thesis over at Western on the two-spirited people, and I'm trying to get into touch with him because there is an issue that I want to bring up to the council in Cherokee. Um, <coughs> back in 2014, there was an ordinance passed that makes it illegal for uh, gay marriage to be allowed on the reservation, and that was around the time that was in the 2014. Mm -hmm. Around the time that the, the Supreme Court legalized gay marriage for everyone across the United States, so some preachers got together and decided that they would make Cherokee straight, pretty much. Uh, the gays weren't. If they were here, just don't talk about it. Keep it to yourself. But um. It's pretty much Bible verses. Like I've got the ordinance right here. I, I had to laugh whenever I read it. Um, but it says that marriage... Um, let's see. Marriage to be legally recognized, a couple seeking to marry shall obtain a marriage license from and record it with the Register of Deeds in their county of residence. Alternatively, members of the Eastern Band may elect to obtain a marriage license from and record it with the Cherokee Court. The licensing and solemnization of same-sex marriages are not allowed within this jurisdiction. So it's my current goal to get this overturned, abolished, any way that I can to um, make this allowed or legal on the reservation. Because, I mean, if not for me, then uh, the younger generation. I want gay people to be able to marry and love who they want, regardless of where they live. You shouldn't have to go to Swain County or Jackson Fuck County. Yeah, dude. Like your Cherokee. This is in our history. Like, um, there was no uh, bias to who you could marry back then, and there shouldn't be today. Yeah. Um, <coughs> what? What would it take to get that overturned? Like, how do you... That's what you I've got... Into I'm looking into it right now. That's what I've got to figure out. I'm sure I've got to get with uh, council members. Um, and when this was passed, there was only one against it. The rest were four. One abstained and two were absent. So you got the names of the folks oh, yeah. that voted. And I'm going to hunt these people. So yeah, well, that's, <laughs> what, that's what I wanted to ask is, like, what what is... Because I'm not that familiar with, like... Um, tribal council and how they decide these things so mm -hmm. what is the process it gets presented to council and council votes yeah they can vote to pass it um so you can write a new ordinance that says that it's okay yeah as long as you have council members on board to vote possibly accordingly yeah uh and they what does that take some politicking and oh yeah lunches and cherokee is all <laughs> about <laughs> politics these days yeah. <laughs> it's about who you know and oh do you do you believe in your opinion, that this ordinance was presented in um, 
response to the Supreme Court decision. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Direct, no doubt about it. Yeah. And um, that was a different time. I mean, five years later, not much has changed in Cherokee, but um, that's, that's where I come in. I want to start this movement, so to speak, yeah. um, because the time to be quiet is done. I, um, for the longest time, I was quiet about who I was and um, used drugs and alcohol to kind of <coughs> escape that. And <coughs> now that I'm in recovery, um, I just want to make a change. I want to be the change. And yeah. um, I want to be known for something other than what happened in my past. Um, that was then, this is now, and I just, it's really for, not just for me, but for the youth. Um, they are our future, and um, if someone doesn't take a stand now, it's just gonna stay in the closet. Yeah. Do you, when you decided to begin to use your voice to kind of tell your story, kind of come out and be who you are, what what was the defining moment that like you were you decided that you didn't want to live? the way that you did before? Was that kind of hand in hand with recovery or was it? I believe so, yeah. Because uh, after uh, the court thing down in Alabama, I just, I was tired of living that way of life. And I'd been to jails, I'd been to in institutions. The next stop was death. And I'm too pretty to die. <laughs> I, I second that, my friend. I'll give you some love on that for um, sure. <coughs> and I just, um, so yeah, it was kind of hand in hand. Uh, I just came to that realization that if there's a bump on his head, oh, if I didn't stop what I was doing, I was just destined for the grave. And I to, to step up and become a leader in the LGBTQ community. That in the place where you yeah. kind of feared that prior, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it. I don't really see myself as a leader, but other people do, and um, that just um, it just makes me kind of proud. Like, um, well, I mean, you are by <laughs> doing the things that you're doing, by starting this group, mm -hmm. um, and by like putting yourself out there and like being who you are, which is a part of the recovery process, right? Yeah. Like accepting, you know, who we are, what we've done, all those things. But like to like, um, to start this program, to go out publicly and like have these conversations like we're having now mm -hmm. go on that. What was that other show that you did? Uh, um, Cherokee now, Cherokee now, go on yeah. Cherokee now. And then it's the one feather cover a little bit of, yeah, <coughs> we belong <laughs> kind of. Yeah. That's, that was like the first, like major starting point for the group. Um, I'd been approached by one of the writers from uh, the Cherokee One Feather, mm -hmm. and he wanted to do an article on the We Belong group because he had seen fires or he'd heard about it from a coworker. So uh, I did that interview with him, and it was published a c couple weeks later, page six news in the One Feather, and. Uh, it was also placed on the face the Facebook Cherokee One Feather page. I mean, there were the there were some people that were against it, mm -hmm. some were for it, and then um, from there I did the Cherokee Now interview with Chris McCoy, and that was a little eight minute spot on local Cherokee cable vision, talking about the group, uh, pretty much what we're doing now, just not in depth, mm -hmm. and. Um, you hear all that stuff, though? You hear all those yeah, things? Yeah, yeah. That's what, that's what yeah. I call a leader, my brother. That's what I call a leader. Like, doing all those things, putting yourself out there, putting in the work, mm -hmm. showing up every week, right? Yeah. Not to mention, we haven't even talked about that. You have a um, <coughs> fairly active social media presence. Uh, yeah, uh, we have our own page on Facebook. It's We Belong. That's the name of it. And uh, <laughs> about 235 members right now, just people that I've added from my friends list and other people from... Uh, local communities. But stuff, I see Asheville. stuff going up on there every day. Yeah, I try to keep uh, different things posted just in 
uh, the LGBTQ community, things that are happening across mm -hmm. the United States, uh, and I'm even starting, the world. I'm starting to see a dialogue yeah. between group members, too. It's starting to get a little bit better. At first, it was just very quiet and like, what is this? Uh, who is this person that added me to this group? <laughs> and <laughs> we've so, There's so many groups out there, bro. Yeah. There's so <coughs> many groups out there. You gonna howl for us? <laughs> There's so many groups out there. You get added to one every day, but yeah. like to see people start, no, 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 no. To see people start like actually using it and taking advantage of mm -hmm. it, and posting stuff and all those things, um, <laughs> shows the presence. You know, shows the presence and the impact that you're making, and also the demand, the need for it. Yeah. Right. People wouldn't show up. People would back out of those groups if they. If and some have here and there, yeah, but um, not gonna too happen. many. I mean. It's going to happen. There what is a lot of support. Where do you see this thing going? What's next? Uh, next is this ordinance, the marriage law thing. And um, after that, I'd like to get more members to come out and show their support. Uh, again, you don't have to be gay. Allies and supporters are welcome. Okay. I want to start doing service work in Cherokee, um, just showing the Cherokee people that we're here and that it's okay that we are who we are. And we still want to help. We still want to be a part of the community. And I, I believe that's very important for Cherokee people to find their place in the tribe and um, figure out who they are in that community and be something bigger than yourself. Help others. Treat people the way you want to be treated. My boy Carter is having some fun yeah. tonight, son. <laughs> Somebody gave him some milkshake. This is the second time he's been here, and the last time he had a, a, a little girl with him and a little boy. It was uh -oh. on a Christmas party, and so they were just like, it was mayhem. <laughs> um, it was a lot of fun. So, um, Your recovery consists of many tools, right? you got, you got many tools in your toolbox. Right? Oh, yeah. <coughs> um, something that I wanted to pick your brain about is um, fitness. Oh, yeah. Because you're very active, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, how did you how did you begin to apply staying active, working out, hitting the gym? How did you, like, be, what was that, the initial, like, shift like? Because um, uh, many yeah. people struggle with it, mm -hmm. right? Like, we talked, you were there when we talked to Tom. Yeah about nutrition and fitness and stuff like that myself being one of them is like i struggle to get out to get to do stuff i struggle to do it because like i've always had this like um metabolism that runs at a million miles an hour i've never n needed the physical like you know what i mean the visibly looking in the mirror i've yeah. never like okay I'm, I'm in decent shape for somebody my size but the times that I do get out there and I do um, put in the work, um, I see I see the value, I see the impact that it makes. Mm -hmm. So like what was that shift in 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 your life that like got you into the gym? And then what role does that play in your recovery today? Um it was actually when my recovery started back in June. <coughs> I um I found that it, in order to help me stay clean, I needed to have something to do. And there I had a lot of idle time in my hands. Um, so I just decided to go to the gym one day and started working out very lightly at first. And then um, started picking up momentum from there. And I started changing the way I ate, more healthy greens, vegetables, fruits. Um, I've always known how to stay fit and what to do through school, um, just learning in different education classes. But uh, when you're using, I mean, you don't really care about that stuff. Um, not only do you not care about it, you forget about well, it. Well, yeah. <coughs> so I just needed to fill my time, like, during the day, and you know, idle hands are the devil's play thing. So I would go to support group meetings. I'd exercise. I'd, I started going back to church. But um, exercise was my way of kind of releasing uh, anger or any uh, issues I was having with 
people or situations. It was my way to release, uh, relieve stress. So um, during that hour on the elliptical or that hour on the treadmill, I done killed off about five people in my head. <laughs> Um, <coughs> but it was just a healthy way for me to relieve that stress and um, clear my head. So I kind of traded addictions. <laughs> I went from drugs and alcohol to exercising every day, at least three hours a day. And I started off at about 255 pounds, and now I am 185 pounds and dropping. My skinny jeans don't fit anymore, and I've had to tighten up my belt. <laughs> I'm sorry. Can you just go ahead and repeat yourself for the audience that's listening <laughs> at home, my friend? Uh, the last six and a half months, I've lost over 70 pounds uh, due to exercise and eating healthier. Mm, shift in the diet. Yeah. Um, what type of like what type of program? Like, what are you working? And what are you doing? Do you have like a set? Okay, today is cardio. Today is weights. Like, what do you? Is there anything specific? Do you have a plan? How does that work? How'd you learn it? Yeah. Um, I just learned it by doing it. Um, at the Cherokee Fitness Complex, there are trainers there. But um, me being a gay individual and out, pretty much everyone knows about me. So I, I kind of get the feeling that I'm not well liked around all the straight guys. Um, but I wear my unicorn shorts. <laughs> 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 um, maybe once a week. But um, <coughs> so I try to I just stay to myself and. Uh, I do an hour on the elliptical, an hour on the treadmill, and then I do chest, abs, uh, glutes, and leg press. And that's pretty much a set routine every day. And you got some big goals coming up. Oh, yeah. Um, uh -huh. I'd, I'd become uh, part of the Res Hope group, I believe, late September, before the uh, Cherokee Parade for the fall festival mm -hmm. and that's when you first started getting involved with res hope yeah um i'd known about caleb for a while because he'd done the run out to oklahoma i was working at subway at one point and he'd come in almost every other day and then i saw his article in the one feather and i was he was just like uh kind of like a an idol for me um my, boy, my boy loves that <laughs> subway man i tell you we're <coughs> <laughs> Bianca's looking at me. My boy loves that subway. I'll tell you, when I first started the podcast, um, when I first wanted to do a podcast, and I would see him, it was a, it was six, eight, eight months before the run. Mm -hmm. And I, would s I saw him at the Cherokee Recovery Rally, the one that was outside yeah. the fairgrounds. I was there for that one. I heard him tell a story there. And I, at that time, I was thinking about doing this podcast. And so I had reached out to him on social media. Um, just, just to like set, see if we could meet and see if he had interest in kind of like an adventure like this, and he was like, "Yeah, all right, make me over, make me over at Subway." <laughs> <He's got the> <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so our, oh. so our first meeting to is where NC Raw came to life. Was at one of those tables inside oh, the wow. inside the Subway. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Carry on, my friend. Um, but I'd seen the change that he was starting in Cherokee and. <coughs> just kind of looked up to him for what he was doing. I was like, that's a person that I want to be further further down the road. And I was uh, at an NA meeting one evening, uh, recovery on the res at the hospital, and people were talking about the res hope group. Some were against it, some were for it. I mean, gossip happens, people talk about you. They think um, even if you're doing good, there's uh, ulterior motives or there's something behind it um but i never listened to stuff like that and i just wanted to see what it was about so i went to one of the meetings or the classes and they were gearing up for the float that they were making for the um fall festival parade which happens every first week of october on the reservation and uh many sleepless nights later we'd finish the float and i was just grateful to be a part of something like that I'd never done anything like that in my life and uh, just walking down through Cherokee with that float seeing all the hard work that we'd put in and telling people how amazing they were even though it made us feel weird um, we started I think we've started a change in Cherokee um, of course walking down I, I I heard different things like uh, at the start of the parade. <laughs> this will always stick with me. There was this woman 
and her she had her young child with her and uh, they had asked some of the people to give pictures to put on the float. It was a huge mm -hmm. pink heart. And the pictures were <laughs> of us before in addiction and then one on in recovery. Um, and this, I'll never forget this, this woman told her young kid, now I don't ever want to see your picture up there on one of those <laughs> floats, ever. Do you hear me? <laughs> And I kind of, I mean, I got it, I understood it, but at the same time, it, it kind of made me feel bad. Uh, maybe you shouldn't be telling them that way. There's a different but, um, way to deliver yeah. the message <coughs> to where the, a child might be more receptive right. to staying away from the drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but we won first place, uh, business class, and it was just one of the greatest days in my life so far. And um, it was also because of the Res Hope group that I started getting back into church. Also, Miss mm -hmm. Kim Sanuk, if you're out there listening, she was a, a very big part of my getting back into church, too. I worked with her at the Cherokee Indian Village, the Okona Lefty Indian Village, which is a recreation of the Cherokee Village from the 1750s. And I learned so much about our culture and our history and our heritage. It made me be proud to be Cherokee again. Um, back... Uh, when I was younger, it was just about that per cap check. Like twice a year, you were proud to be Indian. <laughs> um, but now I have a sense of who I am and where I came from, and that that's lacking in Cherokee right now. I feel like. Yeah. But um, with leaders like yourself and people like Kayla, like again, like we talk about sh changing and shifting culture, mm -hmm. um, you guys are doing that, and it's something that like is so difficult to like do, like. It's just, I, I could compare it to like what we're trying to do at SCC with collegiate recovery, but it's like you're trying to change the culture, trying to change the mindset, educate folks and, and uh, stuff like that. And um, no matter how hard we work, no matter how much effort that we put into it, we come from like a society of like instant gratification. So we want to see these results like yeah. immediate, but yeah. these things that we're <laughs> trying to do, like take time right it takes a, a, a long amount of time oh yeah and so like you know i can continue to i, I have to continue to remind myself that like i kind of like try to set these little goals of like not trying to like not trying to look at look too deep at the impact that we're making today but to like set these goals of like okay every five years Every five years, I'm 37 years old, okay? So every five years, I'm gonna sit down and like reflect on the impact that I've made on our community, on the impact that I've made or, you know, the, what we've left at SCC and the, as I've moved on and like what, but I can't do that once a week. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, I can't do that once a month. If I do that once a week, if I do that once a month, it's gonna drive me crazy because I'm not seeing the results when I do these meditation groups on Mondays and Wednesdays and one person shows up, I'm sure it's like, you know, yeah. you know what that's like, mm -hmm. but I'm there, right? If nobody shows up, I sit there for the whole hour and I meditate yep. by myself, you know, because that's the type of person that I am. I have those expectations for myself. And then guess what? My homies start showing up, right? Next thing I know, there's three or four people in there. Next thing I know, I'm getting an email from a mother over the weekend saying, hey, my son's a new student and we're interested in this stuff. And like, but it's taken like three or four years just to have these little, these little mini, mini experiences, mini tastes mm -hmm. of what I'm trying to build and what we're trying to, to accomplish. But my mind, it's not enough, right? Like yeah. I can't, like, I want to see more. I want more. I want more. I get, is it the, is it the addictive, habitual patterns of yeah, thinking. We want what we want or when we it, want it. Yeah, or is it just like five minutes ago? <laughs> five minutes ago. <laughs> Welcome to the conversation, Bianca Dardine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so in working with Res Hope, in doing these things and being ex an example for the kids, right? Mm -hmm. Telling people they're amazing, right? As you walk down that parade route. You guys, you're doing other things. You're like combining it with your fitness to where now, like, you're. Uh, we're gearing up for a 
huge thing we're doing this summer in June. Uh, it's we're gonna be running slash biking the Pacific coastline, starting at the Canadian border and ending at the Mexican border. And you're on that team that's going. Yes, and I, I'd, I'd been exercising and was just losing weight before any of this had started, and then once I became a part of the group is when the three hours a day started kicking in and um, <coughs> I started taking it seriously, just training and getting my body ready to do something like that. And um, so far I'm up to about six miles in about an hour. And that's running, jogging, um, which before I would have never even <laughs> thought possible. I'm back down to the weight that I was when I was in my late, teens like 1920 yeah something to be very proud of my friend well there was drugs involved at that time <laughs> 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 um yeah this is all healthy and the right way to do it um so you're getting on a treadmill you're running for an hour straight yeah is that what you're telling mm -hmm. me and you hit knock out six miles yeah Ooh, just boy about. so i did i hit the so all um all winter break <laughs> the camera keep the camera is shaking like crazy <laughs> Um, all winter break, I was like, I've been, I've been starting slowly to get a little more active and all winter break. So I started like doing this pretty, like, um, this like strength and conditioning kind of yoga at home in my house. And, um, it's been awesome. Like I did it all throughout our, started it in like November, December, and it got me itching to like get into the gym. And mm -hmm. so I was like bouncing around like, all right, can I afford a gym membership, right? And I shopped around, called some places here in town, the three that are here. Yeah. And you know, I was just like, it was weighing on me. Like, is some is it something that if I'm gonna pay fifty dollars a month, forty dollars a month, am I gonna like use it enough and this and that? Mm -hmm. So I decided to just um, ride it out until winter break ended because we have a gym at SCP. Yeah. Um, that is free to students, and it's really nice. It's fairly small intimate setting but it's nice and rarely used there's not a lot of students who take advantage of it mm -hmm. um so i'm like all right i'm gonna get back in there so like today was our first day back at school right yep. like, all right here we go bro <laughs> <laughs> you've been doing this yoga thing long enough time to get into the gym and um so i rolled up in there about one today got on the treadmill knocked out two miles i was about dead no. like freaking <coughs> dead right so then I was like, all right, I stretched it out a little bit, hit my, did my two miles, stretched it out, and then I hit another two miles on the bike. And then my buddy showed up, and we went out and played basketball for like an hour, hour and a half, like a one-on-one, -on -one, like real, pretty pretty serious cardio. Like mm -hmm. we, were, we were going at it. Like we were, we were playing hard yeah. with each other. Um, then we went back into the gym, lifted a little bit of weights, just real, not nothing too crazy, because I was getting like a little tired by at that point. Mm -hmm. You know, and then we're getting ready to leave. And I was just like, man, my buddy was like, all right. And I knew I had to, I was going to be coming here. So I was like, we got to get a shower. I got to get a shower and get cleaned up and stuff. My buddy goes to leave and he's like, all right, man, I'm going to go shower it up real quick. And I was like, and I just heard, I heard Caleb's voice in my head. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I was like, no, no, no. I was, <laughs> like, I was like, come on, dude. I was like, we got to get back on the treadmill and run at least one more mile mm -hmm. before we leave today. Because, um, <laughs> I just I just had to do it, right? Yeah. But now I'm like I'm paying for it. But oh yeah. but walking out of there, um, and then we went and meditated. You know, meditation is a vital part of my recovery process. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been involved with Refuge Recovery, which is like a Buddhist mindfulness based um form of treatment and recovery. It's pr it's a program. Mm -hmm. And um so then we went and meditated for like thirty minutes. And like between all that that time, it just like and then sitting there meditating for thirty minutes, it just like I I hadn't felt that like present, that refresh, that like energy, like the all the stress from the day of doing my internship and planning for what's gonna go on for the semester and doing stuff for this podcast and posting things and all that stuff that like the initial like first day back at school, the semester just started, all that stuff was gone. Yeah, It had like faded away and it was just gone. And so now it, I sat and talked with my buddy and made some like serious plans to 
like continue this and go do it every single day um, and continue that kind of like momentum. So like I totally see like what what it that the value in in doing it, but it's muted. <laughs> um, I totally see. Carter has joined us. <laughs> we have a a new uh, cast member <laughs> on the podcast currently, Mr. Car- <coughs> Mr. Carter Nations. Would you like to say hello to our guests who are tuning in? There's a million people watching right now on Facebook. Hello, hello, <laughs> hello. I love you, Jordan Mason. Oh. <laughs> you say you love them. They're amazing. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Thank you, sir. But yeah, I get that. Uh, it's it's a very good stress relief, and it just gets you so in touch with yourself. And um, I feel like that's important in recovery to uh, be healthy inside, mentally, okay. physically, emotionally. Um, and it you got to take it slow at the beginning. Yeah. Of it. Don't overdo yourself because you will get burnt out. You could possibly get hurt. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, 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 I did start slowly, and then it just progressed from there. Um, but you do start to see a change, and don't feel discouraged if you, you're not meeting your goals or you're not losing the weight that you want to or gaining the muscle that you see yourself doing, because um, it takes time. And I've, this just finally clicked with me maybe a couple of weeks ago, but the amount of weight that I lost... Uh, I've got this certain goal in mind to where I want to be, and I was talking with Jill, I believe, um, about the amount of weight that I'd lost and how seeing those weight commercials or the weight loss commercials and, like, Joe lost so so many pounds in six, seven months, and it was just a low number. I was like, well, that's kind of where I'm at right now. I didn't think that it would take that long to do that, and I really wasn't focusing on... um, the amount of weight that I lost or how I looked, I was just doing it to get ready for that big event coming up this summer. But um, I have seen a big change in myself, um, and it makes me feel a lot better about who I am um, outside as well as in. What do you hope to gain from this trip? Like, what are your, what are your goals for this yeah. major accomplishment? Um, You're talking what? couple thousand miles yeah um, it could take us maybe a couple months uh we're not really sure on the logistics yet but it's quite a distance to um take on and we were asked (laughs) this question actually in the last class um (coughs) what do we want from to get out of this trip what are what is our um driving force that's kind of um gearing us up for this (laughs) um, <laughs> cause mo- I mean, n- no uh, hard feelings whatsoever. But my boy kind of needs a little bit of. He's really good at achieving mm-hmm. the goals, but he needs to be like, and we're you know I mean we've had conversations. We're talking about like the logistics and the planning of it, but like, it's easily to get distracted with like because yeah. there's so many things going on everybody wants them everybody wants has something you know what i mean so they're like what is the objective what do you hope to accomplish what are you going to be doing on a day you know what i mean like yeah. th- those are the types of things that i think about when um setting such a enormous goal mm-hmm. um <coughs> i'm really looking forward to the the spiritual awakening part of it, or the, that aspect of it. Um, I am getting a better and closer relationship with my God, the God of my understanding, my higher power. And I feel like something like this will just make me that much closer to Him. Um, and also, it will just be like something to mark off your bucket list. I mean, who can say that they have actually run slash biked the entire Pacific coastline. And in Caleb's, uh, in what Caleb did, um, who can say that they've ran the entire Trail of Tears? Very few, my brother. Yeah. Very few. 
but um, and uh, just a, a closeness that we'll get with our group and our fellowship with the Res Hope um, members. Um, it's just going to be an eye-opening experience, something I've, I would have never thought I'd do um, before in my life. But because of Caleb and this group, I have this um, opportunity, and I'm not going to waste it. Something I'm looking forward to. It's going to be a, <laughs> a hell of an adventure, I tell you what, brother. It's going to be a, a pretty pretty amazing adventure. Um, <coughs> one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, Jose, that we kind of, it's we can hear it, but it's moving. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about that I can kind of, um, is the LGBT community mm -hmm. and kind of, we talked about the normalization of like <coughs> drug use and alcohol, like from the, at the home, like perspective, but growing up in a large metropolitan city of Tampa, Florida, mm -hmm. um, there was, when I was young, there was a per very large, um, LGBTQ party scene. Oh yeah. In that community that we lived in, in much of my, um, much of m me being heterosexual, much of like my party and took place at like gay nightclubs in t in town because they were the fun places to be, mm -hmm. right? So it's like very like normalized in that culture. Yeah. So like what has um what has the process been for you number 1 like not <coughs> not not being as accepted as you would like in your community and doing the things to change that. Mm -hmm. But then car please stop. But mm -hmm. then um <coughs> but then you know in the small gay community that is there like recovery is probably not like the hippest thing you know what i mean is yeah. there like do you, is there any like, is there barriers with have you experienced barriers barriers in that kind of culture in that scene like i mean obviously we always when we get into recovery we always need to like change our environment mm -hmm. change the people, change our places, surround, things. people places things all that stuff so like that's an obvious but like you know what I'm getting at? Kind of. Kind of. Um, it's just that there's, there are people that are gay in Cherokee, but there's not really a gay community per se. Not yet, anyway. That's what something I'm looking to change. But um, I'd say in a bigger area, there would be some barriers because you have <coughs> that, that big party scene that you were talking about where it's just um, the norm. Um, and, but in Cherokee, um, I don't know of too many other gay people that have substance issues. Okay. If, if there are, I just don't know about it. Yeah. Um, there's also not I'm a big, pretty sure there's not are. a big bar scene. And no, bar, yeah, <laughs> you've either, got the so casino like and that's it. Yeah. Um, <coughs> but, uh, I guess for straight people, there would be those barriers, um, to where they just they don't feel comfortable or they don't trust people to help them because they've just been cast to the side and shunned and called junkies or druggies or all those bad terms that people struggling with substance abuse are um, depicted as. Yeah. And um coming into the Res Hope group, I realized that those were bad terms to use and because you never know what those people struggling with substance abuse are dealing with. I mean, you don't know what they're going through, the struggles, the things that they're trying to mask from this by using drugs or alcohol. And so I believe in our community, there are a lot of barriers placed against us struggling. Yeah. Um, 
what do you um where do you see this thing going? This res hope recovery movement. Um I see it uh I see it blowing up really. I mean I just I'm very proud to be a part of this group and it's just uh, it's uh, we're gaining momentum and we've got the ball rolling. Um I see it making a big change in Cherokee. Hey, no, no, no. Oh. <laughs> We've gone dark. <coughs> Goodness. The lights are out, baby. <laughs> but um it's it's gonna make a big impact in the community. I feel like it's gonna bring all the communities together and we're just we're gonna thrive from this and um uh, hopefully make Cherokee a, a drug-free place for the future so that there aren't so many issues or um, problems on our reservation for our people. Thanks. <laughs> hey, that's cramp, dude. Big cramp. Um, I'll tell you how I, I had a kind of a, a realization of that today um, at school. I'm talking, we did had kind of like orientation for collegiate recovery and what I do, I'm doing my internship there and we had orientation and so like every every year we kind of like meet and talk about the new students who are in our program. So it's human services, which is kind of like social work. Mm -hmm. And they have a substance abuse counseling degree. It's a two-year AA degree. And so every year we talk about new students who we've kind of identified as students who could potentially become is he hollering out there? Yep. <coughs> students who could um, potentially become like leaders in the program, mm -hmm. right? And students who could um, who would find interest or find value in the things that we're doing and want to become active in this recovery program. And so we got six new students this semester. Every year we get about that in our program, in that field of study. Mm -hmm. So we got six new students, and five of them are from Cherokee. Oh, wow. It's the first semester that we've had, like, usually it's like one mm -hmm. out of the five or six, seven students. One or two, five students out of um, six. And so, like, all of them probably, I haven't met all of them, but all of them, I wouldn't say that they all like identify as being in recovery or anything like that, but they are coming back to school and seeking a degree in um, being of service, mm -hmm. right? Getting into social work or counseling or whatever their <coughs> long-term <coughs> goals are, but being of service and giving back to their community. Mm -hmm. So I just thought that was just like, I thought that was awesome when I heard that that those numbers today. I was like, yeah, it's like whatever. When I was talking 30 minutes ago, 45 minutes ago about not being able to see the impacts, not being able to measure mm -hmm. the impacts that you're making in the community. Like here I am an hour later. That right there is yeah. is measurement of the work that you guys are doing. And that's amazing. I mean, five out of six. That's incredible. Um, and of course, we are in the process up at the hospital in Cherokee, uh, creating a crisis stabilization unit. Um, it'll be two stories and the top floor will house about 10 to 11 patient rooms. The bottom floor is where Anna Lomishki will pretty much have all of their classes uh, for the patients. So it'll be our own little detox place so that we don't have to outsource to different rehabs or facilities for our people. We can have them there. And that's from what I understand, that's the only like missing piece of the kind of continuum of care. Yes. Right. So like mm -hmm. once that once you have that in place, then like all levels of care mm -hmm. are in place, right? And as from the Cherokee Hospital or yeah. Anna <coughs> um, all the way out to now to um, all the way out to like aftercare stuff, like mm -hmm. with what you guys are doing with Res Hope and yeah. um, your program. So it's like. It's happening, dude. Yeah. It's really happening. But therein does lie certain problems because uh, that's our, us as addicts 
Cherokee, for, mo for most people, that's our stomping grounds. That's our people, places, yeah. and things. Uh -huh. So it's going to be up to that individual to change who they are, change what they were doing, change the people they were hanging around, and try to better themselves. You can't just expect um, everything to happen overnight, I mean, and you can't just expect the hospital to have that um, cure that Passages of Malibu promotes. <laughs> 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 um, one day, baby. One oh, day. yeah. <laughs> I'm sure they'll have a pill. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's got to be up to you. You've got to want it. And that's something I had to face coming into recovery. I, it wasn't to make anyone else happy. It wasn't to um, make myself look good. I had to want it as a person. I had to be done with that way of life. And it's been a struggle. Um, there's going to be my ups and downs. Um, I'll fall down. I've fallen. I just pick myself right back up and uh, keep going. Just I've got that um, goal in sight to that's just yeah. But that's the mindset, mm -hmm. right? and that's the intention that we didn't have. Yeah. <coughs> however, you know, a year ago, two years ago, three years, however long. That's the that's the that was like the I don't know. Th like when I reflect back on like my patterns of behavior, it was like. I was always looking for a reason to party, right? Yeah. It was like, all right, it's, uh, it's you know. It's the weekend it's or it's Cinco yeah, de Mayo. It's Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> it's every day. day. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> my cousin's third, my third cousin's sister's birthday. You know, it's <laughs> like there's always something. Oh, we made our sales goal for today at work. Yeah, let's go happy hour. You know, there's always a reason to do it. Mm -hmm. And now there's always a reason to not do it. And like to be of service. Oh, yeah. To um to live this this lifestyle mm -hmm. that is recovery every moment every day is a reason it's the same kind of like intention that i had prior yeah um you talked about a little bit about the role that your spirituality has played in this process of recovery mm -hmm. and like specifically like getting involved with your church and yeah. doing stuff like that um <coughs> which it can also being somebody that from the gay community can also be somewhat of a barrier. Oh, yes. But you seem to, like, be able to, like, overcome that, mm -hmm. find your home, find your place, find your tribe, whatever you want to call it, yeah. like, and really use that, um, that aspect and apply that to your lifestyle mm -hmm. to allow you to thrive and prosper, right? Mm hmm And it was yeah. not easy, um... I've always had issues with religion and who I am as a gay person. So coming back into recovery this time, I was at an NA meeting one evening, and <coughs> there are spiritual principles that we follow. And my friend, Miss Kim Sanook, had invited me to uh, Yellow Hill Baptist Church in Cherokee. So I went to church, I believe it was one Sunday, and just sitting there listening to the preacher um, just taking it all in, not really, uh, not really being too serious about it. And I looked up on the front wall and there was the church covenant. And that was word for word, all of the spiritual principles that were, that are followed in the NA program. And I was uh, just something clicked right there. And I felt like I was where I needed to be right at that moment. And so I started taking it more seriously. I started reading the Bible. And then one day at uh, Yellow Hill Baptist, they were talking about um, <coughs> sins. And, of course, in the Bible, it does say that homosexuality is one of those sins. And um, whenever the preacher brought that up, most of the fellowship, they were for what he was preaching about, how, is it, how it's a sin and... Um, it's bad pretty much in the eyes of the Lord. And I started get to get down on myself, and I started looking up on the Internet verses from the Bible that were against homosexuality, and I just kept getting even more down on myself because, uh, I mean, th it seemed to me that no matter what I did, no matter how hard I prayed, no matter how many times I went to church, that just because of who I was, I wouldn't be allowed to enter the kingdom of heaven. 
and then I talked to a friend of mine from one of the recovery meetings and she kind of put it into perspective for me and she showed me the better side of the Bible. And there are certain scriptures that say that uh, it doesn't matter who you are, come as you are. The Lord loves the scarred, the broken, and he uses us in many different ways. And so um, I, I kept going back to church and I didn't let it stop me because I know that my God loves me as, as who I am. I mean, he made me in his image. I have his DNA inside me. He gives me the breath I breathe every day. And he loves me no matter what, regardless. And um, I started going to Christ Fellowship Church as well in Cherokee. And <coughs> whenever I started going to these churches, I went up to the preachers and I asked them, straight up like what is your stance on homosexuality and I told them I was gay and they both gave me the same response read the Bible and see what it says to you and so I did more reading and more research and it actually made me feel better about myself yeah. and that's where I'm at today um, I have a good relationship with my God and I know he doesn't make mistakes and I feel like there are those people out there that will not agree with this. And actually, I had a heated discussion the other night on Facebook um, about this subject. There were those for it. There were those against it. And we, were, we both had scripture to back up our sides. But I didn't see it as a bad thing. I mean, it was, a, it was good that this is being discussed. I feel like it needs to be dis discussed more and more. It was a healthy conversation. Yes. I didn't. I wasn't on there bashing anyone. I wasn't uh, making them look bad in any way. I saw their side, but I also wanted them to see mine and where I was coming from. Um, and of course, there were side commentators from different people for me, against me, for them, against them. But all in all, I was glad that it happened because maybe someone saw that and it opened their eyes to see that. Um, if you are gay, it doesn't mean that you can't go to church and that you can't be loved by God. <coughs> yeah. That's the way I see it anyway. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it, it, it's just that, like, I don't know. I'm not, like, involved in any organized religion. Mm -hmm. You know, I do practice meditation and study, <coughs> study Buddhist philosophy, which is essentially just living a pure and ethical lifestyle and mm -hmm. investigating like how more of a psycho the psychology behind it. So investigating how my mind works um, and why I have a, such a craving for pleasure and such a hatred for pain mm -hmm. and how I can learn to like tolerate, tolerate the discomfort mm -hmm. and not get attached to the pleasurable experiences, um, but not through like an organized religion and like what, um, what I struggle with is like in our society, regardless of if you're speaking about religion or um, LGBTQ culture, racism, like we're all human beings. Yeah. Everybody has an opinion and like we spend so much energy, right? Like attempting to prove our point or like air quotes like be right like i'm yeah. right you're wrong mm -hmm. like there's that creates so much division between us yeah and like over time specifically through this process of recovery it's like i've learned to really try to listen more and it's like if you have an alternately opinion on a, a whatever topic than i do like i want to hear it mm -hmm. Kind of like what you did with that conversation. Yeah. Like I want to listen and I want to like, I don't necessarily know, know, know that I'll figure out why you feel the way that you do, but it might open me up to your perspective and to, to, to see how you s view and see the world. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that we're not both human beings. And I don't love you as my brother because you have a different opinion than me and it, there's just so much energy exerted and spent by so many people you're right to discredit somebody else and to prove <coughs> yourself right um that it's just like 
it, that that part of it is what's hard is what I find difficult to deal with mm-hmm. to live with open up your Facebook dude I guarantee you within 30 seconds you can find an argument oh yeah right <laughs> like it's there it is bound to happen mm-hmm. and like I don't understand why like and I guess like because we have these like this form of communication through social yeah. media that everyone's like oh it's my page i got s- i got an opinion so mm-hmm. you know like i just it's just so much to deal with and my, i don't understand why why do you why do you have to like argue like yeah i mean i used to be that way um my way was the highway and if you didn't agree with me you were dead to me and um I feel like social media allows us to be a certain type of person without fear of um, uh, like lashback or um, being hurt physically. Or we, we get to hide behind the, the screen of a computer. No repercussions. Yeah. Um, so we can say what we want and not get in trouble for it. We we kind of developed this other person and yes uh facebook has just become i mean you get on there i get on there every day and i see these comments that people make or posts that they put up about just bringing other people down or um saying all these negative things and i just at times i get tired of it and i just turn it off put the phone down because that, that's all you see these days. It's just all bad and negative, and you hardly see any good. But that's what I did with my page. I, ever since I've been in recovery, there's been enoth- nothing negative. I've not brought anyone down. I've not um, done any of that. It's just been trying to uplift people and kind of get my message out there of recovery or it's okay to be gay or religion. Um I want to. I want to bring like light to a dark place, which is what I think Facebook has become, or social media, Instagram, Twitter, uh, all of that nonsense. I don't even know how to do any of it. I barely Facebook. <laughs> I just learned how to Snapchat the other day, and I don't even think I'm doing that right. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you, man. <coughs> um, well, how can how can someone get involved? With We Belong, if you, if someone's tuning in, can hear our voice, mm-hmm. they want to get involved, support you guys. Yeah. Um, What's the process like? How do they find you? How do they? Well, we meet every Wednesday, 5 p.m. at the Onolinishki Behavioral Health and Recovery Center. I know that's a hard name to pronounce. I can barely pronounce it, but um, <coughs> the address is on our Facebook page, We Belong. Go on there, uh, request to join the group. Um, I also post links to it. Um, I try to at least once a week. But it's in Cherokee, North Carolina. You don't have to be native to come. Uh, We want all surrounding uh, counties to join if they'd like. And again, you don't have to be gay either. Um, We allow allies and supporters. They're welcome as well. And it is a safe and sober environment. Uh, We just want you to feel free to be who you are and love who you love without any harm or any judgment kick ass man yeah that's (laughs) definitely like cherokee is somewhat of like a central location for all these little rural communities Mm -hmm. so like i could see folks from like murphy coming out or franklin and communities that don't have something like what you're right what you're offering when i first started recovery the only refuge recovery meeting was in Asheville. So what do you think, you know, I'd go out to Asheville if I yeah. needed to. Like it's, you got to do what you have to do to, to find it, to find that type of environment that you guys are creating. Right. Um, and I would totally like to come and check that out, dude. Oh, yeah. I'm very, I'm very interested in what you guys are doing and being involved and supporting you guys. So. I mean, w- we have some very random conversations some nights. <laughs> but that's, what, that's what's needed, man. <coughs> that's what's needed in mm-hmm. this in this world that we choose to walk in these days you know that is totally what is needed um 
especially like we just talked about with the social media and so much other stuff going on, it's nice to have a an environment where you can have those types of conversations. Yeah. Jose, I think I appreciate you coming on, bro. You Thank are, you. You're a badass, my friend. <laughs> and I can't wait to get out to the Pacific Coast with you. Oh, you know gosh. It. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be amazing. It's Thank you to Raise Hope. Thank you to Caitlin and Kayla for offering us this opportunity. It, uh, it's just going to be so great. Awesome. We're going to do this again soon, too. Oh, really? I like to bring people back. Cool. S- as your as a sequel. As your, recovery <laughs> b- as your recovery blossoms, so does your airtime. Yay. <laughs> Thank you guys for tuning <coughs> in to NC Raw. Visit our website at www.ncraw.life and drop your email address in the subscription box. It's completely free. I will email you every time a new show gets published. I'll email you links to all of the platforms to listen, Spotify, iTunes, you name it, it's out there. And also visit our YouTube page. Click the little subscribe button. We're posting (laughs) all these videos on YouTube. Um, You guys, the listener, seems to like that visual aspect. Yeah. When I first started, I just wanted to do a podcast, meaning like a radio show. I'm an old Mm -hmm. school talk radio junkie, like an old, just, I just enjoy like spoken word talk shows. So I had no intentions on creating a visual aspect, but Mm -hmm. that's what the people want. So that's what the people get. Visit our YouTube page, NC Raw Podcast, and subscribe. Hit the little notification button. So that way, every time we upload a new show, you will see it. Appreciate you guys tuning in. Have a wonderful evening. Good night.